All right, good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to call this uh, regular Sunday housing and homelessness committee meeting to order. We are noted today, May 15th, from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. here at City Hall. Um, let's go ahead and start with introductions. Cameron Perez Radio. Mark Littlefield. Karen Bronda. Anna Brawley. Randy Salt. Felix Rivera. And then do we have any members on the phone? Okay, as I understand it, uh, Mr. Constant will be joining us later on the phone. Um, and then also for everyone's um, information, we also do have representatives from the coalition, uh, the Anger Coalition and Homelessness on the phone as well. Um, okay, so then uh, moving on to initial audience participation, we have one individual who signed up for initial audience participation, uh, Mr. Glatt. Um, so if we can go ahead and get the timer up. And you can feel free to sit here at, at, at the table and then turn on your mic. Right, thank you. You can introduce yourself. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Eric Glatt. I live in District 1. I'm also an attorney representing 16 people in litigation against the municipality over um, campsite abatements last summer. I don't expect that to be the last of the lawsuits the meeting will take over the issue concerning abatements this summer. Um, I wanted to speak today about the Lay on the Table ordinance that's going to be heard on Tuesday, um, amending the code as to prohibited campsites. Um, I want to share that I think tinkering with the code right now to tighten the ratchet on people is not what the city needs. What the assembly really should be concerning itself with is answering the question of where it will not be a criminal misdemeanor or a public nuisance to shelter yourself out of doors when there's not enough housing and shelter for everyone here. Um, as to the particular ordinance, I want to speak to two particular infirmities I noted. First, I don't think enforcement priorities belong in this part of the code. Enforcement priorities ideally should come from the executive branch, given what limited resources it has to enforce the laws that are in place, it can't enforce all laws in all places at all times, it should be really come from the executive branch to decide where its priorities are going to be. If the assembly wishes to weigh in on what it would prefer uh, enforcement priorities to look like, I think the appropriate way to accomplish that is through a resolution, not by baking something into the code that will be, among other things, very hard to enforce. And second, I, hope I want to address the proposal to shorten the notice period from 15 days to 10 days for individual um, campsite abatements. Among other things, I don't think it's uncontroversial that 10 days, not 10 days notice is sufficient to provide people with enough due process. If you were inclined to ask um, Assembly Council Gates for his, in, his input on that, I would suggest uh, he look at the 1972 decision, efforts v. Bradley, to really interrogate the question about whether not providing people a pre-deprivation hearing before um, taking away all of their belongings is constitutional. And second, I would point out that the community is already contorting the code to provide what look like zone abatements, um, even though they're only giving people 72 hour notice, uh, with some notices that were posted just yesterday. I, I realize I'm out of time and I'm going to follow this up in writing before Tuesday, but wanted to put some of these thoughts um, before you as you're contemplating the issue ahead of time. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, so we do have a question for you from Mr. Sultan. So just a quick question, how do you feel about, you mentioned enforcing laws we have on the book, mm -hmm. and I, I feel a lot of residents and citizens are upset at, at homeless camps and, and the, for lack of a better word, the devastation that's left behind as far as trash. Um, I was on International the other day and there's a camp right next to Campbell Creek and they're, they're throwing their trash in the river. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel on is that what you're talking about enforcing laws? I mean, that too, sure. I mean, I'll notice um, every person I've spoke to who lives in a large encampment has not said, boy, I really wish the community wouldn't come here and take the trash away. Everyone I speak to wishes that the community actually provided more such services. 
uh, I'll note that the municipal code prohibiting um, uh, campsites includes a provision that says nothing in this subsection prevents the community from picking up trash, garbage, and waste. That's a choice that the administration has made, and I, I, I realize part of the counter argument there is a question of budgeting, but that's a, a, a choice the municipality has made not to provide that service. It doesn't require abatement to help people accomplish what they would also like, which is to keep those bases clean. Yeah, I, th I think those people are right there easy. So if you put trash or something close near the camps, I think they'll use them. And there are times when the beauty has done more of that. Uh, more recently, it's done a lot less of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as always, we will make time at the end of the meeting for final audience participation in case any members of the public will like to participate. All right, um, so then that moves us forward to unfinished business. And really, the theme of today's meeting is all about the transition out of emergency cold weather shelter. I think, as folks know, um, we are quickly approaching the timeline where most emergency cold weather shelter will be closing. Um, the Alex, except for possibly a handful of uh, individuals is closed. Um, the uh, aviator is slowly on a drawdown schedule. The East 56th Avenue shelter remains at capacity. Um, and there is some work going on to uh, provide some gap funding to uh, help ensure that the East 56th Avenue shelter can remain open in June when uh, there's currently no funding right now allocated for that. And then in July, we are all eagerly awaiting the legislature to finish their budget and then the governor had to sign it without vetoing the $4 million that we are relying on so that uh, that shelter can remain open in July and that those 200 individuals can remain sheltered. So um, there are a variety of moving pieces over the course of the next couple of weeks. Um, and today we're really going to talk about some of the other ongoing work uh, as we prepare for the transition. So we're going to start with a discussion on AR 2024-162, which was um, something that was added to the addendum at our last meeting for May 7th, and then we decided to postpone that um, as a body to the meeting of May 21st next week. Um, that resolution looks at extending the capacity of 200 individuals at the East 56th Avenue shelter. I think the one provision in that that um, I think sparked some concern from members, including myself, was the provision around the 50 beds and the abatement issue. So let's go ahead and start with the discussion on that. I think on the record at that meeting, we asked a variety of questions. Um, so I will just turn to the health department to address that to get us kicked off. Hi, good afternoon everyone, or good morning I should say. Alexis Johnson, Housing Homeless Coordinator. Um, so the plan that the English Health Department came up with is kind of following suit for the summer plan of um, Next Step, uh, where we took people from the Alex Hotel and rapidly rehoused them into uh, housing with supportive services. We'd like to continue that initiative into summer um, and with the uh, community you know, calling out right now saying that a lot of homeless camps are popping up, um, one of the challenges that we face currently in the landscape is you know, under Martin versus Boise where we cannot abate specific camps um, unless it poses risks to public health and safety. Um, but what this does is this plan gives us 200 individuals at uh, the shelter capacity. We would operate a shelter at 150 people and then keep 50 beds available for the abatement, abate them into shelter with the plan to rapidly rehouse them with supportive services. What this does is it gives people in encampments um, the goal of getting into housing. One of the things that we come across at the health department often is we go into camps, we say we have shelter beds available for you and people just say no right away. Um, they say I'd rather live outside, I wanna, you know, not have the rules, but when we say, well, what if we could get you into housing within the next 30 days? Um, and I think that sparks a little bit of interest. People say, well, where would I be housed? What does that look like? And I think when we talk about the success of Next Step and how well the Alex went um, with transitioning people from emergency cold weather shelter into housing with supportive services, 
people are more likely to enter the shelter knowing that that's not their final um, final landing space. Um, so 150 people in the shelter right now, we know CWS is at capacity. We've had roughly between 190 to 200 people there every night. We're offering, we're out in the camps every day offering shelter beds. Um, we know that the 200 people that are there are really, they've been there. Um, they're the people with the highest needs, highest duty of needs, um, and we need to prioritize shelter at least for those individuals through the summer because these are people that will not fare well outside um, regardless of whether it's winter or summer. Um, and so we would like to keep that 150 capacity going through summer and into emergency cold weather shelter for the winter, but have the 50 bed capacity so that we could post abatement citywide, move people out of those encampments, close them down, get them into shelter with a plan to get them into housing. Um, and there's a lot of um, camps that we cannot abate because uh, they're not posing imminent danger to health, life, and safety. But if we had the beds available, we would be able to do so. Okay, thank you. So I have um, a few folks. First, I just want to note for the record that Mr. Constant joined us on the phone a few minutes ago. Uh, Member Barley? Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I guess. Uh, well, I'll just say first, I was also concerned about this idea of holding beds open for abatement because I, I do worry, um, I understand the rationale of, of making those available, but also want to make sure that we're not um, causing ourselves legal issues by um, by stating that we have enough shelter beds specifically for the purpose of abatement, but not in good faith attempting to, um, to fill them. I, I think that's an issue. Um, and I guess the other general thing is wanting to do do this in sequence. So this was brought forward um, in, you know, basically in the situation we're in now, which is that we don't know if we're getting funding over the summer, um, and um, and also even if we do, that it's part of the FY25 state budget, which means July 1st. And so even if we are assured, assured of the funding in June, we need to have a conversation about do we keep this facility open or not? And there's risk in that for sure in terms of, you know, are we actually getting the funding? because of what Mr. Herrera said around the governor veto. So the two questions I had, um, again, wanting to make sure that we're doing things in proper order, not just saying let's expand the capacity of this, but we have to have these bigger conversations as well. So um, at this point, what recommendation is the administration bringing forward? Um, also knowing that we have one more regular meeting this, um, this month, uh, I believe we have a special meeting on the 31st, but specifically for election certification. So, so it, are we going to see something by next Tuesday that makes a recommendation as far as what we should do in June, whether it's funding, um, operations, what that looks like? And then second question, uh, what conversations has the mayor or administration had specifically with the governor around um, ensuring the, the the preservation of this funding in the budget. Uh, it's, uh, when, when I mean the state funding, the $4 million that we've asked for. Thanks. Yeah, through the chair, Ms. Raleigh. Um, so the first question you had was, will there be uh, funding brought forward? So I will tell you that as of recently, I just uh, discovered that the money that was appropriated for first quarter budget for emergency cold weather shelters specifically states fall funding. Um, and so it doesn't allow us to use that funding for bridge funding through June. Um, also, we were just alerted by SWS that they are putting on an ITV for a roof replacement on the CWS facility. Those questions um, that the health department has posed that we do not have answers for yet is can the roof be replaced with um, people in it? How long does that take? Um, and when do they plan to have it done? Because we know that uh, roofing right now is pretty hard to, to come by, at least for workers and labor force. So, um, those are all unanswered questions. Right now, I don't see an avenue for us to continue through June without additional funding. And the communications we've received from OMB is that there's very limited funding uh, in the alcohol tax budget that would cover this. Um, as far as communications with the governor, I know that the mayor has had communications with the governor saying that this is important for our city. Um, you know, Anchorage is an economic hub and we need to at least continue shelter for the highly vulnerable. And so. Um, I know those conversations have been had and that the mayor continues to advocate for the state, but at the end of the day, the governor will get to make his decision. Um, but I know that the mayor and the administration have been lobbying hard uh, as well as in Juneau. So. Thanks. And, and a couple of follow-ups. Um, first, just to state, um, yeah, the, the 
additional money that was put in the budget for fall is intended to be for next winter, and so there was never a discussion that that would be used for June. Um, and the idea being that we need to, again, uh, make good on our commitment that we made to the legislature, which is to continue to, to fund that in the winter months. So that was that's what that is part of. And I guess the other thing is I'm thinking more, um, uh, I understand the idea of thinking about alcohol tax. Another option is to do an interfund loan because what we're talking about is really, um, again, the ask was to the legislature to cover for the summer months, which could include June, but there's just a timing issue where we won't get the money until July, even if they are very proactive. And so, um, so I think the conversation first needs to be about um, what is the decision of what to do with this facility that needs to be done soon. That is not something the assembly can just decide. So we need to work together on that. And then second, um, if, if we decide that we're taking a little bit of that risk, leaving it open till June rather than decommissioning it and having to start it all back up again in July, then we do have funding options, um, especially if we do anticipate state reimbursement, but we do need to uh, start thinking about that soon. Great, uh, thank you. Um, so I am next in the queue, and then if other members want to do the queue, just flag them down. Um, so, Couple questions for me, two questions for you, and then I think one question for the coalition. That's, I believe they're on the phone. So, um, first one is so it sounds like the administration's plan is uh, to keep the East 56 shelter, CWS, at 150 individuals. That is going to be the new sort of de facto capacity with an additional 50 for this idea of transition from abatement to shelter to housing. Um, so I guess my question is, right now, CWS is at 200. I imagine that's probably gonna stay at 200. Um, so is there gonna be a point in time where 50 individuals are gonna be kicked out of CWS? And uh, if so, what is that gonna happen? Through the chair, Mr. Rivera, we lose people into attrition every day and then new people fill those beds. Um, so if we had the attrition, we would just continue to close down those beds until 50 were available. We wouldn't be displacing people that were actively engaging in shelter and resources under that roof. Okay, so then I guess the reframing of that question is, when will CWS no longer be accepting new clients? Through the chair, Mr. Rivera, I think through attrition, I couldn't give you a specific date. We usually lose about 10 to 12 people a day. We fill those beds that night. Um, so if it took five days, we'd be past 50. Great. Right. Okay. Maybe I'll ask my, my question in a slightly different way. So at what point is CWS going to say, we are no longer accepting any new individuals into the shelter because we are keeping these beds open? via attrition for this 50 transition to a into housing. Yeah, I think if we got broad support saying, yes, this is the community plan that we would like to go with, we, I mean, 50 people could walk out the door tomorrow and we would just say, hey, this starts tomorrow. But if it's one a day, it would take 50 days. I really don't have a date specific and we're not gonna displace people currently in shelter. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I have you in the queue, Member Saltz. Um, but I have uh, a couple other questions, and then yes, I have some other questions. So uh, next question is: So you have mentioned um, health, life, and, and safety. Um, so am I to assume that the administration plans on? And I, and I guess we'll get this into a little bit when we get to the summer twenty twenty four payment plan. But am I to assume that um, the administration interprets? that you can abate for health or safety reasons? Through the chair, to Mr. Rivera, we believe under Martin versus Boise there are exclusions to the shelter uh, component, the requirement to have the number of shelter beds, and one of those is health and sa public health and safety. Okay, great, thank you. Um, all right, then I guess my question for the coalition, and then I'll move on in the queue. Um, so, the coalition, um, I think there are a couple of folks on the phone. Uh, I think uh, uh, Ms. Zolotel and Ms. Parks are on the phone, so whoever would like to respond. Um, so the coalition is the managing entity of the various pieces of the Next Step pilot program. Um, so I guess from your perspective, this idea of 50 beds at CWS to serve as transition for some X amount of time as folks go into housing, 
Um, can you just uh, speak to that idea and your ability to implement it and your thoughts on it, please? Sure. This is Miguel Tell, Executive Director of the English Coalition and Enhancement. Um, we do not. Sorry, there's the echo. Um, we do not need 50 shelter beds set aside. Um, it is our intention to go out and house directly from encampments. So, for example, if we, um, as we evaluate the encampments and we evaluate our housing available and our resources available, um, we will pick an encampment that meets uh, the right sizing for what we have available for resources, and then we will work to close that encampment down straight to housing. There is no stop in shelter. Um, when we talked to Houston about this model, um, going to shelter actually was a much, um, it was problematic. It was too many transitions, and we really cautioned against it. The only reason we did it with shelter this summer was one, we'd never done it before, so going outside in the winter, we just weren't, weren't sure what we would encounter. So we, we leveraged the emergency cold weather shelter and the policy uh, that it be housing focused. Um, so, and we also think if we set aside 50 shelter beds for purposes of um, having that stop from encampment to shelter to housing, you're creating an inverse incentive to leave the shelter, to go outside, to be identified for next step participation, to then just go back into shelter. And that doesn't make a lot of sense to us. That feels really inefficient. Okay, thank you. So we have three folks in the queue. I'll start with Amanda Prada. I was just going to ask the question, Ms. Johnson. Um, I, my understanding was when you abated Davis Park, um, they would not go to the shelter. And so I, I just, I'm trying to decide how you would get 50 people to take those beds because it does seem like the people I'm encountering do not want to go to the shelter. And so you know, I just feel like this probably will not work in, in that means. And then it looks like we're gonna be talking about the safe parking later. I really, really hope that we can figure out where people are going because um, this is not looking pretty out there. I'm, I'm telling you. I, I know Mr. Lott said they will clean up for themselves if we allow them or they want people to clean up for them, but it doesn't appear that way. Um, the way the woods look is not good. Thanks. Thank you. Member Schultz. Thank you. So, I guess it's surprised us. People want abatement. So we're doing this. Um, I think it's irrelevant whether it's 150 or 200 beds at the shelter. The goal is you're going to rapidly try to move people to house and always have the space to either abate or pull people from housing from the shelter into housing. That seems to be the chance that the 200, 150 really doesn't matter as long as you're making a step change and pushing people to housing. Is that kind of right? Through the chairman, Mr. Salt. The reason that we are taking this shelter step, and I will tell you I've had many communications with Houston, they have the housing units ready to go, and we don't. So neighborhoods call us, they say, there's people, there's problems, they're breaking into our houses, et cetera. They want a timeline to say, this is going to be cleaned up. And right now, we don't have an opportunity to say that. It's unless there's an imminent public safety or public health issue, we don't have a right to abate without the shelter beds. But if I can go in and I can say, Chomstein Park, there's 40 people there, and I go in and we communicate to the campers, come to shelter, we will be rapidly rehoused. We will work through a focus, it's a focus group. And I can tell the neighborhood, in 10 days, every person in this camp will no longer be here. It's a win for the neighborhood, it's a win for the clients. We had multiple people advocating to go to the Alex Hotel, knowing full well that they were leaving to go into housing. And when we show up to encampments and we say, hey, if you just come to shelter, we'll get you clean, get you the help you need, the resources, and in a month you will be in housing with supported services, they are more likely to go. When you just go to an encampment and you say, go to shelter, they have issues with shelter, they have histories with shelter, sometimes they're not allowed in shelter. Um, but when you make 
the deal with them saying at the end your goal is housing we're going to focus on this core 50 people and devote our resources to this entity and the neighborhood's happy i think it's a win for everyone the difference between anchorage and houston is we don't have 2200 beds or housing facilities for people to rapidly be rehoused into um, and so i think when you have the goal of we need to clear these 50 beds out in order to abate another camp and to get people into housing you really start to see the wheels start turning with the work being done. Great follow-up. So it seems like, to, to Ms. Altel's point, abating, going better from camp to shelter, maybe the, the minute difference is that you're getting them into the system first so you can start working with them, get some of those services around them, and then get them into into housing where it might be more difficult to go directly from a, a camp to housing. That fair to say? I would say it's fair to say my only thought is if you go in and you have 40 people in an encampment, I can't enforce an abatement until those beds exist, whether those be shelter or housing units. So I can't go in and tell a neighborhood in East Anchorage, yes, this facility will be closed down on this specific date until every person in that encampment has a bed, whether that's shelter or housing. And so abatement to housing, I'm all for it. I'm a supporter of it, but we need the housing units and without the housing units, you struggle on your timeline. And I can't tell the neighborhood, your, your problems are going to end on X, Y, Z day. It's just, hey, I'm working on it. I will get them into housing as soon as possible. Yeah, just one last point in, in response. It, it, the neighborhood wants, and well, that title the question, the neighborhood wants the abatement because of the issues with the camp. So whether it's trash, whether it's crime, whether it's whatever, so again, it's a space for the municipality to step in to help mitigate those things, whether it's provide trash bags or whatever. Um, again, going back to it, homelessness is one thing, violating rules and laws is another. Thank you. Thank you, Member Garland. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess first I just want to observe that I hope this whole conversation about um, basically helping neighborhoods feel more safe. And I, I totally get that. And that has been the conversation in this town for many years. I think it's also incumbent on all of us to really be honest and realistic about that. Because I think, you know, because we get it in our emails all the time, people saying, I just want all those people to move somewhere else. I just don't want to see them anymore, right? And, and I think there's a lot of compassion in those statements because it's people realizing that this is a bad situation. And, and this is the situation we were in last summer too. But I think we also need to just be honest about like the time that it will take and the effort and the, the funding that it will take from whatever source, which can include private funding, um, that this is actually going to get solved or really get better in any meaningful way. And so I just want to say that because I feel like we focus so much on making the people is it directly in front of us who are asking feel better, but it is not necessarily helpful if we are not also honest about the reality of the situation. So I know that's a broad statement. Just want to put that out there. The specific question, um, you know, again, thinking about doing things in sequence, this is something that I asked uh, in the meeting on the 7th with the intent of coming back. So there's three ways that we extend emergency shelter. One is in the winter, there's if the temperature drops below a certain degree uh, for an extended period of time, it's automatically triggered. That's what it, our winter shelter is, emergency uh, cold weather shelter. The second two scenarios where that can happen, and at least one of them has happened before in 2019, uh, one is that the mayor can declare an emergency uh, for the purpose of saying we don't have enough shelter beds, uh, we need to activate emergency shelter, we need to allow private shelters, whatever it is, really suspending some of the rules that allow that. The other one is that the health department director makes that determination as well. So, so there's actually a fair amount of power with the health department director to do that specific thing. So my question is, when is that going to happen? And is there any scenario where we are even allowed to extend the capacity of the shelter legally given the, the, this situation in our code? Because um, that's something that I'm hoping we see very quickly so that we can keep talking about this. Yeah, through the chair, Ms. Riley, um, the mayor or the health director, I don't believe have any issues with declaring an emergency. One of the things that we have found out the last time we declared an emergency was that there's no funding that comes with it. Um, funding is the issue that we have. Um, when we declare an emergency to continue cold weather shelter uh, at CWS location, there just needs to be funding behind it. And right now, we don't 
see that funding. Um, and when we went back to look at first quarter budget revision, what we got was just emergency pool building shelter funding. Um, it was set for fall. So there's really no funding allocated to this effort. Um, if there was or some were identified, I see no issues with having the administration declare an emergency to continue operations at CWS. Thanks. And I'll also say, um, you know, I see that you're saying um, there is no funding. That That is a solvable problem, and it is coming collaboratively to the assembly, to the budget and finance co-chairs. I understand Member Zalatel is conflicted out. I have not been uh, contacted on that. I haven't heard anything from other assembly members that are being asked for that funding. So I just want to say these, again, are solvable problems. It requires saying, let's work together and figure this out. Let's talk about what the funding options are. Um, because also the assembly cannot create funding out of nowhere. We also need to understand what the options are. And those were the conversations that myself and Mr. Rivera had back in, I think, September, January, March, all those times that we brought forward extension of funding. Those were not things that we did on our own. We worked together with the finance staff to figure that out. Um, and we are willing to do that. But we also need to know from the health department, what is the operational plan for that facility? How much do you need? Uh, what is the time frame? I mean, all these questions, and they're not things we're going to answer in this committee, but these are exactly the kinds of things we need to be working out. And it cannot just be the assembly figuring it out on our own, and it cannot just be the health department saying we need funding, we don't have it, and that's the end of the story. We just can't do it that way. Thank you. All right, so um, I have one more individual. You're looking at me, Mr. Little. I think I mean, when you? this is all done, I have a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. uh, like on this specific topic? Well, okay. The shelter itself. All right, sure. So I will add you to the queue then. And then um, we have several other items that I think we need to get to in terms of discussion. So I will take myself out of the queue and then um, two more folks. So Member Perez Rio. Thank you. Um, I won't repeat all the things that have been said. I, I, I think that the distinction between uh, the idea of, of, um, of leaving them in place versus moving them to shelter and then to housing, and I think I understand that clearly. I think going back, what I don't understand is, is again, what the proposal is. And if, if the proposal is 50 additional beds in order to abate, right? Um, and can you go back and explain what you were saying about how you maintain those 50 beds? So are you saying that, that once those 50, 50 beds are, are filled, then you stop abating? And so what were you saying before about how you were gonna uh, create a constant opening so that you can, can, can continue to, to abate? I don't think I followed that. Yeah, so we'll just give a hypothetical scenario. So for instance, if we go in and there's a neighborhood that's having increased problems and they have a camp that has 40 people, I think about Chomsnew. Chomsnew was abated last summer because of construction site, but had that construction not be going on during the bridge, we would have had limited availability to abate. However, if CWS had existed last summer and those 50 beds were available, we could go in, notice everyone and say, hey, in 10 days, this zone is being abated. We're offering you guys shelter with the promise that we will rapidly rehouse you to get you into a housing facility with supportive services. What we would do is we would post that abatement, it would close down in 10 days, and we would hyper focus on the 40 people that were moved from that encampment into the shelter. Same thing we did at emergency pool to the shelter at the Alex, where everyone who was there was essentially made a priority to get into housing with case managers and supportive services. They housed every single person that was at the Alex um, in the final days, and all of them have supportive services. I think there's a 98% retention rate. And so what you would do is rather than have a new uh, abatement posted during that time, you would wait until those beds closed down, everyone was in those 50 beds were housed with supportive services, and you would start the process over again. Um, that ensures that we're not just going through and playing, you know, everyone says the term whack-a-mole in the city, and you're making promises not only to the people who are living in the encampments, but also the neighborhoods to say, yes, we are prioritizing your neighborhood, we are focusing on these set forth individuals, and we're moving them with the plans to get into housing. And I think when you start that pipeline and the wheels and the focus, and everyone's hyper-focused, rather than trying to solve a community-wide problem in the immediate, you're focusing on very small little pockets of people that we, I believe we can successfully house with supports. 
I think I understand that now. So the, 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 is there not an option to do the alternative, and that is to, to identify where the camps are and work with them just like you would work with them in the shelter and begin to rapidly rehouse to, to the community camp? But the reason I ask that is because of what um, 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 and Zelotel said in terms of the, the process and the, and the energy of moving all of that. And I, I, I think I don't know the answer, but that's, I think, the debate that is in front of us. The, the difference between serving them in place and moving them is extremely much. So I, I, I appreciate your answer, but if you have something else to add, would be great. No, I yeah, I think um, the difference is that if those housing units immediately existed and we had something like the Barrett or like the Golden Lion, I mean, we filled the Golden Lion in three days essentially or physically in two weeks but on paper in three days and if we had a facility like that where we get a beta camp right into housing the neighborhoods would be happier but when you're focusing on 40 individuals and you're trying to find a housing unit with a case manager to support that one person 40 separate times you don't have a 10-day timeline and so i think this process that we're proposing is that they move into shelter, they're getting showers, they're getting meals, they're getting case management outside of a neighborhood. And so the neighborhood is at ease. And I know that there's a give and take with homelessness where it's like, I understand it makes the neighborhood uncomfortable and we really need to feel for the people in the encampments. But at the same time, we also need to give some, you know, clarity to neighborhoods. Because right now, I will tell you, I have 600 emails in my inbox in the last two weeks of people saying there's homeless camps popping up and I'm limited. There's really not much I can do aside from send Anchor Health Department out to provide outreach or alert the coalition. Um, but if we had a plan and we said, hey, your neighborhood is next, we're focusing on these 50 people and we're going to prioritize them into housing and we're not going to stop until everyone is housed in this camp, I think you'll start to see a difference and a happiness within these neighborhoods of saying, it's, it's no longer in my neighborhood and they got housed. They'll feel better about it. Just, just, just one, one final comment. I, I just want to reiterate what Mrs. Crowley said is that I, you know, I, I appreciate that. I think what I'm hearing though is that the coalition is in one camp, you're in another camp, and I think the assembly is waiting for a, 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 a somewhat of a, of a plan in terms of how how this is all going to work, and, and then a request for funding for that that that, that, that plan. So I, I, it feels very disjointed, and it would be nice to have. Something more comprehensive to to consider. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Member Littlefield, and then we'll move on. Thank you. Um, I just have a quick question. You uh, made a brief mention about the roof repairs. Is it repair? Is it replacement? Are we in serious jeopardy of losing this facility for 30, 60 days? This might be a moot conversation if that happens. Yeah, through the chair uh, to Mr. Littlefield. So the communications that SWS told us is that the building needs a roof replacement. I don't know how urgent that is or if it's something that is currently scheduled. Um, I wish I knew more about it. I've posed some questions to SWS. How timely is this? Um, I think what they're doing is they're putting it out to an ITV. It has not hit the streets yet. It'll be out for 30 days. Um, and you know, it's possible we don't get a response or it's possible that it's they can't do the work until the following year. And so we're really at the mercy of that ITV response and then we can make a plan for that. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna uh, move us on and I'm actually gonna shift things around here and I'm gonna move us to the implementation of the designated safe parking areas. Um, so can the uh, administration give us a status on that? Through the chair, Mr. Rivera, I don't have an update for safe parking areas. I know that we have a meeting scheduled to start talking about it. Um, lately, our focus has been on the kindness camps and other legislation that we're working on, but we have not picked up uh, safe parking areas. Thanks. Sorry, can you repeat that again, the what camps? The kindness camps, we were working on the church. Oh, the registry, that's mm -hmm. what you want to call yeah. um, okay. I think that's what it was called. Yeah. Um, and then the pallet shelter, RFGP as well, is being worked on. Got it. Um, yeah, go ahead and then go ahead. And so it's my understanding from Kenny that we don't have anybody who stepped forward for those kindness camps. So you can set that aside and get on the safe parking. Take this. 
<laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, and I guess with the with the safe parking, um, the way that it was crafted, and Mr. Gates can remind me, um, it, it allowed either the municipality to designate our own parking lots as a designated safe parking area, or much like the kindness camps, uh, relied on um, nonprofit, for profit, religious entities to also step up and designate safe parking areas. Um, so. I understand that things are still in the works, but has the administration given any kind of intent as to whether it will uh, designate one of the municipalities' parking lots for this? Through the chair, we have not picked up this project yet, but I will uh, work with my team to start the process. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions on? All right. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Brown. So you think you can get an estimate on, so what we're gonna to need to allocate funds for the safe parking and um, dumpsters, bathrooms, and if we have to lease a lot. I, so you think you can dig into that fairly quickly and get us an estimate of how much money we would need. I'm, I'm hearing from people around Denali, you know, that went from Cuddy Park to very close by, and we really need those spaces. So. Through the chair, Ms. Ranga, we are hearing about the people on Fairbank Street. One of the issues in our code and code enforcement is that if you move a vehicle on street parking within 24 hours, it starts the clock over again. And um, people who are living in their vehicles know the rules, and so they will move 10 feet um, every single day to avoid being uh, you know, displaced. And so, um, yes, it is an issue that we're seeing on Fairbank Street. We're trying to work through that. Secondly, I just want to put on record that um, when people are living in their vehicle, it creates a whole new separate set of parameters versus a junk or abandoned vehicle um, that the Muni can tow off. So if someone just parks a junk vehicle on the side of the road, the Muni can all it away, but if someone is currently living in it and all their personal belongings are in it, um, it's very difficult and legally challenge, challenging to tow it away. And so it uh, creates a whole new set of parameters that our code does not clearly identify. Thank you. So yeah, it sounds like implementation of the designated safe parking areas will begin at some point in the near future. So I guess we'll get an update on that. Uh, Soon, I hope. Um, so then I'm going to move us on to the RFP for Transitional Shelter Pilot Program. So I think as folks know, we have the, um, one of the predicates to putting up the RFP as stated by the administration was the Title 23 changes. That's going to be before us on Tuesday, uh, next Tuesday. So assuming we approve that, then that I think opens the pathway for the RFP to go out. Um, so I guess my question for the administration is, um, has the RFP been developed? Is it in development? Can you give us sort of the broad strokes of what it'll look like? Yeah, through the chair to the body. Um, yes, it is in draft form. It's currently being circulated through the Anchorage Health Department. Um, we originally were told that um, through the Title 21 changes, the code change that was going to happen was that it was going to be a specific parcel of land where the rules were kind of suspended so that Central Lutheran uh, could run the program that they wanted. So we actually didn't draft an RFGP originally, it was just gonna be a sole source. Uh, but now that it's open community-wide um, and that the title 21 and 23 changes are going before the body, the RFGP uh, was drafted recently and so it's working its way through the health department. Uh, we're hoping to have it posted here in the next two weeks. Thanks, and um, just because I know there are probably folks listening who are very interested in this, can you just give us the, sort of the, the broad strokes of what kind of requirements might be put on um, with through the RFP for folks who are interested in the um, $500,000 that we set aside? Uh, through the chair. So one of the things that I actually wanted to bring up today was that this is just for operations of the pallet shelters or block housing or tiny homes. Um, and so uh, one of the things is that the entities who are bidding on it will have to um, purchase their own facilities. So they'll have to purchase their own pallet structures or block housing or cubes. 
what are the languages uh, or a specific entity. So um, that's one of the requirements. There is some minimal touch peer support. We were going originally off of what Central Lutheran had wanted, which was um, they considered elders at 50 and above, people who needed minimal case management, 24-hour uh, access to bathrooms and showers. Um, those are just some of the basic entities um, that I can think of. Trash disposal. Um, I think that's it that I can remember. Thanks. Is HMAS one of the requirements? Through the chair, that'll be through the case management, like touch case management. So everyone will have to be enrolled in uh, HMIS. Got it. Thanks. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Um, I just wanted to go back to the designated safe parking areas of an absolute point. Sure. Um, just one point of clarification. The ordinance that was passed, they were 2024, yes, it actually is broader than you described, Mr. Rivera. It's any person that owns pieces or otherwise can demonstrate lawful authority to manage the area of real property may apply to provide this fancy parking area. And uh, that makes sense. It includes government agency to do so. And so it's not limited to nonprofits or churches or so forth. I mean, Walmart could apply if they want to make some of their parking areas available. So at least they need all the requirements uh, for a plan. Great. Thanks for that clarification. Um, okay, any other questions or thoughts on the RFP? Uh, I guess um, when it goes out, how long will it be to go out? I think the minimum is 14 days, but we usually set it out for 30. Okay, thanks. Uh, all right, that's it. Go ahead and respond. So, I, the, this RFP for the shelter operators for these pilot programs. Um, are there other, have you heard, are there other groups that are wanting to do this? Or are you just hoping that if this is available out there, it may encourage people to start a pallet community? Only one I've heard was Central Luke, and I was just curious. Through the chair, Ms. Ranga, in my backyard, was the only entity that we have ever corresponded with that showed interest. But um, I will also state that, uh, so members will just whisper down here, very good. Uh, but beyond that, I will also state that when we uh, appropriated the $500,000 in the November budget process, we didn't uh, appropriate it to be specific for one project. We really appropriated it to be whoever wanted to apply for the fund. So I, I do think that what the administration is doing is in line with our intent. Uh, okay. So then moving on to, and we really have been talking about this uh, in various facets, but moving on to the summer 2024 abatement plan more holistically. Um, so can the administration speak to um, how you will be handling abatement this summer? You know, in particular, I see sort of two different scenarios, possibly three different scenarios, depending on what the Supreme Court does. Um, Scenario one is sort of current status quo, um, so sort of the current rules and regulations and understanding of Martin v. Boise. So scenario two is assuming the ordinance that we put forward um, gets approved on Tuesday. I think that also changes the paradigm a little bit. Um, and if that's, of course, that's not an assumption we should make that it will get approved. But um, let's just assume that it does scenario two. Um, how does that sort of change how the administration will approach abatement for this summer? And it, you know, I think generally speaking, whenever we talk about abatement for this summer, the important there's I think two important pieces to this. One is transparency for um, the community writ large, uh, so that they understand how abatement is going to be handled. If there is going to be a big answer, what's what's the plan? I get asked by one particular community council every single year, what is the plan for payment? Please share it with us. Um, and then, the, of course, that second thing that I think is important, um, frankly, probably even more important, is for people experiencing homelessness to really understand what the abatement plan is going to be. Um, so I'm wondering if the administration can just speak about the abatement plan and those couple of scenarios that I threw out there. Yeah, through the chair to the body. So right now our abatement has been status quo. We are complying with Martin versus Boise. Um, we've been receiving a lot of um, 
complaints about homeless camps popping up throughout neighborhoods, what we do is we prioritize the patrol department to go out, um, provide outreach, see if um, there's anything that we can offer them that would fit their service needs. Um, and then while we're in the encampments, figuring out if there is health, life, and safety issues. Are they close to a roadway? Um, are they set up right next to the highway, which is one of the things that you know we deal with quite often? Um, are they uh, living in so much filth that we need to come in and prioritize healthy spaces to make sure that the encampment is cleaned up? So right now, I would say status quo. Um, we are prioritizing abatements uh, when health, life, and safety is an issue. Um, another thing that we are going to start taking into consideration is wildfire danger um, and uh, talking to campers about burn bans and uh, making sure that they're having safe fires because we know that they are happening. Um, I think the oral arguments and the Supreme Court ruling will have um, impacts when, when it comes. We don't know. It's between June and August of when we think that's going to come. Um, and then how Tuesday passes. Uh, or if it passes, when it passes, um, kind of changing our strategy once that happens. Um, I know that right now we are prioritizing camps that are near shelter spaces that have become, or uh, licensed shelters that have become problematic. One of those is Harlem and Third Avenue. We're seeing some issues there um, with the campers on that street. Um, we have posted Quiana Park downtown, um, and we have posted one in Girdwood um, after a fire out in Thanks. Um, I guess I'm assuming that for the um, ones that are around licensed shelters, that that includes just the quarter mile that's currently in code. Through the Trader Mister River, yes. So Carla and Third is right across the street from uh, BFS. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, any other? Questions or thoughts generally about the summer 2024 abatement plan? Things are still up in the air, is my sense of things. But, yeah, go ahead. And yeah. uh, is there a timeline when we will have that plan? Through the Chairman of Supervisor, yeah, I think Tuesday, once that's voted on, it will dictate kind of what our summer looks like, um, if there's any big sweeping changes, and then once the Supreme Court, we'll have to change our meeting code to comply with that as well. Thank you. All right. <coughs> okay. So, um, yeah, that's sort of TVD as things evolve over the course of the next uh, week slash months. Uh, okay, I think that pretty much takes us through our um, discussion of the transition out of emergency cold weather shelter. Um, yeah, go ahead, Member Robbie. Sorry, I, I know we're trying to move on. Um, just this is just a request. Um, since you said you know what we vote on Tuesday, um, if there's any possibility to put something in writing for what Mr. Perez Verdia said in terms of a memo, uh, it doesn't have to be a full plan, but just kind of here's our preliminary thought about how this will work. I think that would be really helpful and would inform. Uh, our conversation. I know the addendum deadline is about, um, it's actually exactly 24 hours from now, but um, but if it's even uh, something that needs to be laid on the table as information on that would be helpful. Thanks. Yeah. Can I just add one thing? Which is yeah, sure. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, and I, I think that what would really be helpful, I think um, to the degree that you can, is to provide uh, the administration's thinking about what, how they plan on how the, the sort of summer is going to roll, roll, roll through and, and what are some of the actions you're taking and priorities, these kinds of things. So I think it'd really be helpful to, to the degree that that can be fleshed out so that we can have a sense of that. And I think that that would help us, I think, to think about how we can <coughs> support that. Thanks. Through the chair, Mr. Professor, yeah, we'll start working on that. Thanks. Yeah, All right. Um, any other general questions, thoughts, comments on the transition out of emergency cold weather shelter? Okay. So um, yeah, in the next, I guess, just a brief recap. In the next couple of weeks, um, Aviator will completely draw down. Uh, are they completely drawn down to zero? 
through the chair. So the Alex is closed. We have 157 people remaining in the aviator and they will uh, go down to zero on May 31st. And currently, as of last night, we had 193 people at CWS. Thanks. Um, so yeah, th those are the, the numbers and the, so the issues that we're facing. Um, <clears throat> at some point uh, in the future, you know, I think it would be really great if we had a sense of how things were going to go before emergency cold weather sh shelter closes. And that was a goal that we've had for years now, but I think we are still in a positive space when I consider the Next Step pilot program work that's happening and the possibility of their work for this upcoming summer to house an additional 150 people. Um, I think right now they are at what was the number that I saw? 118 housed, so they need to have another 32 people uh, by the time emergency closed when the shelter closes. And then, and that count is a few days old. That's May 10th, is that count? Uh, and then, if the Next Step Pilot Program can successfully house another 150 people, which we haven't really talked about what the municipality's fiscal um, relationship is going to be with that, uh, but uh, perhaps at some point we will, um, but I think that will have a huge positive impact on some of the negative things that we see this summer. Um, all right, so with that, um, I will go ahead and move us on. I didn't put anything under new business just in case this discussion took us all meeting, um, which did not. Um, so I will go ahead and move us on then to um, final items participation, um, items six and seven really being uh, placeholders when we're ready to actually take action on any of those items, which at this meeting we're not. Um, so would anyone like to participate in final items participation? Yeah, come on, Mr. Oliva. Um, anyone else? Uh, okay, so I see Matt. Nah, sorry, Mr. Matt, you did it initial, so you okay. can't do both. I was just saying it was about a different issue. Sorry, yeah, but you can't do both. That's fine. Um, but if you want to communicate via email with us, feel free to. Um, okay, so I see two individuals. Um, so if you want to go ahead and turn on that mic, uh, and what uh, Good afternoon, Ron Oliva, 50 year resident, uh, adjacent to the brother of Francis Shelter, was cut short. Uh, the last time I was talking about uh, the unfortunate three sexual assaults I saw in four days and unfortunately testified at a grand jury in tears to say that it was not consensual. She uh, took off her crutches uh, and thanked me. The sadness is uh, I thought it was a conviction and this was six years ago and I got a call that they're going to uh, retry them, and am I available from me to July? So uh, this exploitation and uh, crimes against the homeless, uh, they affect uh, not only the victim, but also people who witness it, and that's me. And I want to say that I am thankful for the chaplains who came down, but they couldn't come down and counsel me. And I thought, well, I'll bring my wife because the sexual attack, you know, describing that was very difficult and graphic. Uh, he said, no, it was too unsafe and they needed a male chaperone or a civil assist, so they had a timing. And then, fortunately, she made it down. Most important thing is to finance those chaplains. Uh, they did a good job ended up counseling me, but also prayed over me and gave me the armor of salvation, which made me very resilient and also helped me with my court sentence to anger management. Uh, I, I can control my anger, but my disappointment is extreme, mostly because of this committee and the assembly and their efforts to solve the homeless problem. Uh, I have not been contacted about my ideas with the tent, and it's shameful that your minds are already made up and not even open enough to schedule a discussion of possible other ideas where you would be schooled, educated, 
and hopefully apply some of the ideas to solving the, hob the homeless problem as a team effort. So that's a great disappointment. Uh, there's others financially in the homeless that cost me my business, uh, my financial security, but uh, hasn't broken my spirit. You can steal all that, which I consider you've done by causing harm. You shall do no harm, but you did by your decisions of action and inaction and basically have come down to a failure. In a remote possibility, are there any questions or do your minds continue to be made? Though. I do not see any questions for you. Felix, you. you shouldn't be so rude and interrupt the speaker. Your diplomacy is deplorable. Thank you, Mr. on you. Your time is up, though. Um, all right. So we'll go ahead and go to the next individual. Come on up. Your mic's already on. Well, it's easier for us to hear because you're too far from the mic. Okay. I don't Are those that have something to hide from it? 
Thank you. Your reports are not enough. Your time is up. Money and services are not mis mismanaged magically. Money, staff, and services need strict oversight. Thank you. I'm sorry I continued further, but I believe I didn't have much more issues. No disrespect intended. <laughs> of course. All right, not seeing anyone else who wants to participate. Um, I will go ahead and address. Thanks, everyone.